The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. Last week we began looking at the Lord's 10th post-resurrection appearance. The appearance he made to the gathered apostles in Galilee after he had appeared to the seven on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. And this appearance is recorded for us in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, where it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, though some still hesitated. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Now, last week we covered verse 18, where Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and I explained that that authority is the basis on which the commission that follows is established. Remember, according to Matthew 7:29, the reason the people of Israel were first drawn to Christ before his ability to work miracles was widely known was because unlike the scribes, he spoke with authority. But that authority wasn't native to him. It was given to him by the Father. That was the way things had always been between the Father and the Son. John tells us in John 1, 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. When God the Father opened his mouth and said, Let there be, the word that proceeded from his mouth was God the Son. And the word went forth, and it was so, for the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. The Father speaks the word, and the word does what the mouth of the Father has spoken. And that relationship continued in the Incarnation. As Jesus tells us in John 12, 29, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. But, in proximity to the resurrection, probably between his appearance in the garden tomb and his appearance to Cleopas and Mary, when Christ ascended to the Father to enter the heavenly tabernacle and offer up his own blood in the Holy of Holies there, the Father gave his authority to the Son. And in Matthew 28, 16-20, Jesus delegates at least part of this authority to the apostles. And the apostles were bound in their authority, just as was Christ, to teach only what they had been taught by the Lord. Which is why we receive the Bible as the Word of God. Because we believe that in the Word, the apostles, who wrote and or authorized every word of it, have written only what the Lord commanded them. That's the burden and the privilege of apostolic authority. And this authority is a prerequisite for the commission that follows. Jesus doesn't say, go ye. No, he says, go ye therefore. And the therefore in that commandment points to what came before it. And what came before it was the authority of Christ. Go ye doesn't mean go everyone. As Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.11, the Lord gave the church some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be shepherds and teachers. And the some ones that he gave to be apostles are the only some ones who have been granted the authority to carry out the command of Matthew 28. And it is to this command that I want to turn our attention this morning. And the first words of the command are, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now the word that's translated nations here is the Greek word ethnos, from which we get the word ethnic and ethnicity. And this in itself is remarkable, because under the Old Covenant, God had commanded the children of Israel to withdraw from all other ethnic groups, particularly when it came to exercising their faith. For instance, when God ordained the Passover feast, he said in Exodus 12:43, Let no stranger eat of it. But here Jesus says, Go ye unto all ethnos, and make disciples of them. And though this probably didn't dawn on the apostles right away, what Jesus was saying was, go and find every kind of stranger and invite them to come and eat of this Passover lamb. And go, they did. In John 16, 32, on the night that he was to be betrayed, Jesus said to the apostles, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, 
when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And usually when we read that, we think of what takes place later that night when Jesus is arrested and Matthew reports to us in Matthew 26, 56, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And as Mark reports to us in Mark 14, 50 through 52, then the disciples deserted him and fled, except for a certain young man who followed on, though he was unclothed except for a sheet. And when they tried to take him into custody, he fled naked, leaving the sheet behind. And most Bible scholars think that this unnamed young man here is Mark, the evangelist who wrote the gospel. Now, this could be the fulfillment of what the Lord prophesied in John 16, 32. It certainly would seem to fit the bill on the face of it, or at least almost. I mean, not everyone fled, at least not right away. Mark stuck around for as long as he could. And when the disciples fled, they didn't go far. At least, Peter and John didn't. No, while Jesus was being tried in the house of Caiaphas, John was standing right there in the house, and Peter was standing in the yard, just outside the house. And none of the disciples went very far. Certainly none of them went to his own home. Indeed, no one of them so much as even left the immediate vicinity. The eleven apostles that remained were all from Galilee, but they didn't return to Galilee, they stayed in Judah. They not only stayed in Jerusalem, but it appears that they all stayed within a few hundred yards of where Jesus was at any given time. They were standing at the foot of the cross when the Lord was crucified. So, though there was a scattering when Jesus was arrested, those who fled did not go each to his own home. Now, just to be clear, the word home does not actually appear anywhere in John 16. No, what Jesus actually said there was, you will be scattered each to his own. The word home has been supplied here by a number of translators who intuit that that's what Jesus had meant. But the actual wording here is similar to what is found in John 1.11, where the King James Version properly reads of the word made flesh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. It is only later translators that provided the word people there, interpolating that into this verse, giving rise to the sense that he came unto his own people, and his own people received him not. My point here, however, is simply that, as I understand the matter, the scattering of the disciples upon the arrest of Jesus could be what the Lord is referring to in John 16.32, but I don't think so. But the key to understanding what he was referring to lies in our understanding of the word scatter. You see, the word that's translated scatter has at least two senses in which it may be understood. One negative and one positive. In its negative sense, it refers to a scattering of the sort produced by chaos, such as that brought about by violence or fear. That's the idea that's in view, for instance, in John 10:12, where Jesus says, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. In its positive sense, however, it refers to scattering of the sort produced by intention, such as that brought about by a farmer sowing seed into his field. That's the idea that's in view in 2 Corinthians 9, 6-11, where Paul says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he is impelled from within his own heart, not out of reluctance or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God has the power to make grace in all its fullness overflow within you, so that you, having all sufficiency in all things at all times, may overflow into every good work. As it is written, He has scattered abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything pertaining to your some purpose, whatever produces through us gifts of grace to God. And if that's what's in view in John 16.32, then that casts a whole new light on this verse. Because with that in mind, I would be inclined to translate this verse Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered abroad by me alone, each to his own destination. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And if that's the idea that's in view in this verse, then what the Lord is referring to is not something unfortunate that must occur before the gospel enterprise gets underway. Rather, he's talking about something intentional that he himself will do, 
probably the work that he would begin in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, 5 through 11. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And of those in Jerusalem who were present for this event, about 3,000 were added to the church that day. Now, we don't know how many of these were permanent residents of Jerusalem and how many were dwelling there only for the duration of their pilgrimage for the holiday season. But according to Tacitus, the Roman historian, the general population of the Jerusalem metro area in the first century was about 600,000. And according to Joachim Jeremias, during the holidays, the city had an influx of about 150,000 people. So, on Pentecost, one in five people in Jerusalem would have been there on pilgrimage. And after the holidays, they would be scattered abroad, each to his own home. And when you look at the languages represented in the crowd in Acts 2, what you find is that the geographic area into which these disciples of Christ would have dispersed is astonishing. Because what Luke tells us is that among those who heard, believed, repented, confessed, and were baptized on the day of Pentecost were people from 1,500 miles in every direction. If you take the data presented to us in Acts 2 and lay it over a modern map, what you will find is that when the first Christians were scattered abroad and went each to his own home, even though the apostles themselves remained in Jerusalem for some time, Nevertheless, within weeks after the church began, there would have been Christians as far-flung as regions we now know as Afghanistan, Albania, Algeria, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Belarus, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Chad, Crete, Croatia, Cyprus, Phyram, Egypt, Ethiopia, Georgia, Greece, Hungary, Iran, Iraq, Italy, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Kosovo, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Malta, Moldova, Monaco, Montenegro, Niger, Oman, Qatar, Romania, southwestern Russia, Saudi Arabia, San Marino, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Sudan, Syria, Tunisia, Turkey, Turkmenistan, Ukraine, Uzbekistan, and Yemen. And when the apostles did leave Jerusalem, they were scattered far and wide as well. Only two apostles died in Jerusalem, James the son of Zebedee and James the brother of Jesus. Peter was martyred in Rome, while Mark, his protege, served as bishop of Alexandria in Alexandria, Egypt, and is said to have done mission work as far south as Sudan. Indeed, if you go to a Nubian church today, they will tell you that they were established by Mark. Andrew died in Petros, Achaia, on the Peloponnese Peninsula of Greece. Philip in Hierapolis, Byzantine, in modern Turkey. Bartholomew in Albanopolis, Armenia. Thomas is the apostle who ventured to go further eastward than any of the other twelve, and he planted more churches than any other apostle. Thomas traversed the Himalayas, traveling through modern-day Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, and the whole length of India to its southern tip a distance of 4,300 miles across extremely hostile terrain, traversing passes as high as 18,000 feet. He arrived there in 52 AD and traveled the whole length of the western coast, planting congregations all up and down the coast from Lakpat to Kanyakumari, a distance of 1,700 miles. And many of these churches still exist today. They're known as the Malankara Martoma, the Churches of Thomas, and they can trace their origins back to the arrival of Thomas on the Indian Peninsula in the mid-first century. Matthew was buried in Ethiopia. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot in Iran. Thaddeus established churches in Armenia before dying in Persia. Paul traveled thousands of miles as an evangelist from as far east as the Dead Sea to as far north as the Black Sea and the Adriatic, and perhaps as far west as the Strait of Gibraltar, as there is some evidence that, as he projected in Romans 15, he in fact traveled as far west as Spain. Barnabas was martyred in Salamis, Cyprus in 61 AD. 
Silas was serving the Lord in Macedonia when he died, as was Timothy, who was laid to rest there in 97 A.D. Andronicus and Junius traveled extensively together, and history records a number of pagan temples which were closed or converted into churches in the wake of their travels. Apollos was with Paul in Corinth, and according to Titus 3.13, was in Crete when Paul wrote his letter to Titus. And Epaphroditus is best known for his work with the church at Philippi in eastern Macedonia. By the end of the first century, there were churches in Monaco, Tunisia, Algeria, Sri Lanka, Iraq, and Britain, where Aristobulus, the same Aristobulus mentioned in Romans 16, served as bishop of Britain until his death in 99 AD. Christian art dating to 86 AD has been found in Shuzhou City, China. And by the end of the second century, the Kung Yuye, the first missionaries to Japan, had arrived on the main island and were preaching in modern-day Tokyo. Beloved, that's a scattering of 10,000 miles from east to west and 6,000 miles from north to south by land. That's quite a scattering. I mean, it's hard to imagine that the apostles and the evangelists that they sent out covered that much ground at the time that they did. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's humanly possible, not without divine intervention and divine providence. Because in the first three generations of the church, the followers of Christ established churches in no fewer than 50 ethne. And that is nothing short of miraculous. Because within the lifetime of the apostles, they had reached the entire Middle East, Southwest Asia, Northern Africa, Southern Europe, the British Isles, and parts of Russia and China. So there's no sense in which the apostles failed in carrying out the commission that the Lord gave them in his 10th post-resurrection appearance. No, they gave more than any of us can even imagine giving for the gospel enterprise. And in addition to giving their very lifeblood, shed from Morocco to Moscow to Mingguang to Malabar to Muzamdam and points in between, they also gave us the written word so that we could continue their work under their authority. Because, you see, the apostles made disciples in every nation they could reach, but they couldn't reach every nation. And here's where the lesson takes a turn. Because we have it ingrained in our heads that the kingdom of God is inherently equal, that God treats everyone the same, that Christ is an equal opportunity savior. Well, beloved, the constitution of the kingdom of God is not based on the constitution of the United States of America. In the kingdom of God, things are inherently unequal. Now, when I say that, your minds probably go to 2 Corinthians 8, 13 through 14, where Paul says, For I mean not that other men be eased and ye be burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. But the equality to which he calls them is not the egalitarian equality of current-day Western culture, but equity, proportional equality in their giving. And there's a big difference between the two. In Matthew 7, 6, Jesus told the apostles, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn against you, and tear you to pieces. And in this passage, Jesus makes it clear that the lost are not all the same. There's a definite and profound inequality among candidates for admission to the kingdom. According to Jesus, some of the people to whom you might be inclined to give holy things have no capacity for holiness. Some of the people to whom you might be inclined to give precious things have no appreciation for precious things. As such, Jesus says, don't go there. Don't give holy and precious things to people who are incapable of receiving them as holy and precious. In other words, Jesus says, the gospel is not for all peoples in all times. Now, when I say things like that, it really makes people cringe. People get really itchy, scratchy. And in response, the first thing people usually do is to turn to 2 Peter 3.9, where Peter tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But friends, that scripture has been misinterpreted and misused for years. When Peter says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, he does not mean that God is not willing that anybody in the whole wide world should perish. 
The word any there is translated from the Greek word tis. And I invite you to go when you get home and look that word up. The code for that word is Strong's G5100. And you can look it up on Blue Letter Bible or any other online Bible dictionary, of which there are dozens. The word tis doesn't mean anyone, not as it is used in this passage. The word tis means a certain one or certain ones, and it refers to certain ones from within a particular class of things or persons. Now, when the word stands alone, as it does in this verse, not modifying a particular noun, it can mean anyone, but only when it is in the singular form, because anyone is a collective singular. But it isn't in the singular here, it's in the plural. The form of the word isn't tis, it's tina, and when it stands alone in the plural, it refers to all or some members of a particular class to some of that number or class indicated by the context. Now, I know that Greek grammar just thrills you beyond belief. But this is important, because the way that this verse is translated in almost every translation of the Bible leads the reader to believe that the Lord is not willing that anyone in the whole world should perish. But that isn't what Peter said. Peter's letter is not an open letter to the whole world. It's a letter to the church. And the whole human race is not the class of people that Peter has in mind in 2 Peter 3.9. But he does tell us who he does have in mind in that very same verse. He says, the Lord is long-suffering to whom? The Lord is long-suffering to usward. This is a letter from a Christian to Christians. And when you read the whole chapter, it's clear that Peter has no interest whatsoever in claiming solidarity with the whole human race. No, he sets the saved apart from the human race. Two verses earlier in 3.7, Peter talks about the judgment that is to come on the human race in general. But in 3.9, he states that the reason that we need not worry about that judgment is because the Lord has been long-suffering to usward. And he is not willing that any of us should perish. Well, any of whom? The elect. Those who have been chosen for salvation. That's the word that Peter uses most often to refer to Christians and those who are predestined to become Christians. And in 1 Peter 1.9, Peter states clearly who this letter is addressed to. It is addressed to the elect. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. And he goes on to refer to his readers four times in that letter as the elect. There's no question that that's the class Peter has in mind when he says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He means any of the elect. Any of those who have been given ears to hear. Any of those who have been given eyes to see. That's who, for instance, Paul says he goes to such great lengths for in all the trials that he endures. 2 Timothy 2.10 Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You see, the word elect doesn't refer only to the saved. It refers to those who have been chosen for salvation, whether they have received salvation yet or not. When Paul went into a new town, he wasn't looking for dogs and pigs. He was looking for the lost children of God, those who had been called and chosen for salvation, only they didn't know it yet. But they identified themselves when they heard the gospel preached and responded. That's exactly what happened, for instance, when Paul preached in Athens. Acts 17.32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again on this matter. Now those who said, We will hear thee again on this matter, who were they? Well, they were the ones who had been given ears to hear. They were the ones who had been given eyes to see. They were the elect, chosen since before the beginning of the world for salvation. And those who mocked Paul, who were they? Well, they were dogs. The very sort of dogs to whom Christ warned his disciples not to give anything which is holy. They were pigs. The very sort of pigs before whom Christ warned his disciples not to cast their pearls. Now, friends, I know this is tough to hear. And I suspect that my message today will take a while to digest, a while to sink in, because this is certainly not what I was taught growing up in the church. What I was taught was that if God had his druthers, everybody would be saved. 
That's God's first choice. And in service of his first choice, he makes the gospel available to everyone, and the choice of whether or not any given person is saved lies entirely with them. Now, beloved, that is false on the face of it, and not because not everyone who hears the gospel will respond to it favorably. It's false because not everyone has equal access to the gospel. They never have. And I don't know if they ever will. The church has been spreading the gospel for nearly 2,000 years, but so far there has not been a generation yet that has reached everyone. Now, the first generation of evangelists did a whale of a job. If ever anybody could be credited with giving 110%, it would be them. Because by the end of the first century, they had reached absolutely everyone that they could possibly have reached. But they didn't reach all the nations. And after the apostles died, the territorial growth of the church slowed considerably. It would be 500 years before the gospel reached Western Sahara, Mauritania, Mali, Kenya, Uganda, Cameroon, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Benin, Togo, Ghana, the Ivory Coast, Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Senegal, Cameroon, the Congo, Gabon, Angola, Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, Madagascar, South Africa, Lesotho, and Swaziland. And it would be 800 years before the gospel would be taken in any meaningful way to Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, the Czech Republic, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Finland, Sweden, or Norway. It was 1000 AD before Christianity came to Iceland and Greenland. And it would be 1500 years before the residents of the Americas, Australia, Southeast Asia, New Zealand, and Polynesia would hear the name of Jesus. And the gospel did not take root everywhere that it was scattered. I mean, yes, the Nestorian Christian missionaries did reach Japan in the year 199 AD, but they didn't make any meaningful impact. And the rise of Islam in the 9th century punched a big hole in the heartland of Christianity. And to this day, there are people in China and in several Islamic countries and in several places where information does not flow freely who have never heard the name of Jesus and billions more who have never really heard the gospel preached. And that's just the inequality that God ordained in access to the gospel. And I say ordained because God could have written the gospel in every language known to humankind in the clouds. He could have caused by miraculous means for evangelists to drop out of the sky in every town and hamlet in the world. But he chose not to do so. Instead, he ordained that the means by which the gospel would be spread would be through human means, with all of its flaws and limitations. And he did so knowing that for 2,000 years so far, there would be people all over the world with zero access to the gospel. And with that information in view, I don't know how any Bible translator ever in good conscience translated 2 Peter 3.9 the way that it has been traditionally translated. Because the testimony of redemptive history is that the Lord is perfectly willing that plenty should perish. And that isn't just the testimony of history, that is the testimony of Scripture. But, by the ordinance of God, in these latter days, the landscape of the battlefield has been changed dramatically. By the grace of God, in these latter days, the world has been made flat flatter than it has ever been before. God is leveling the playing field because by God's providence, we have obtained the knowledge, the means, the opportunity, and the wherewithal to get the gospel of Jesus Christ within arm's reach of anyone in the world who has a cell phone. Now, I have more than I want to say about this. We've come to a jumping off point for talking about evangelism and what we can do to prick the hearts of the elect, both near and far, that they might hear the Lord's voice and obey it. But we're out of time for today. So that's where we'll pick up next week. That's my lesson for today. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30, and worship services are at 10.30. We look forward to meeting you.
Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.